Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers. Uh, it's a thrill to be here. I apologize for bringing the snow with me. Um, to get to it. Uh, the period of covenanting rule in Scotland witnessed the deposition of over 200 ministers uh, in which church courts removed clergy from the ministry. Uh, in his study of this process, David Stevenson wrote that the purges were carried out against the opponents of the covenant as well as ministers deemed insufficient uh, and immoral. He concluded that with these purges, this era saw the first successful attempt to exclude the Episcopalian uh, element from the Kirk. Uh, this analysis however, did not account explicitly for the turnover of university faculties. Uh, my goal is to build on this work by evaluating the transformation of the Scottish professorate uh, under the Covenanters. An examination of the changes in the professor will contribute to our evolving understanding of, of Scotland's university. Uh, whose history remains somewhat enigmatic before the 18th century, and especially in the 17th century. Uh, historians' concerns for discerning the origins of the Enlightenment have conjured an image of the mid-17th century as, at its most benign, a period of tepid intellectual transition, and at its most malicious, an era of backwards religious fanaticism. But as new studies have shown, Scots were often engaged with the cutting edge of contemporary philosophical and reformed theological thought. Stephen Reed, for instance, examined the Covenanters' national university curriculum that aimed to ensure students would be able to apply their knowledge effectively. They had to be well-versed in argumentation, rhetoric, and divinity in order to serve in the Covenanters' Kirk. The Covenanters did not oversee an era of intellectual stagnation, but instead grew up contemporary trends. The same can be said for the universities. At first glance, then, a study of the Covenanters' rearrangement of the professor it seems to contradict any argument that the Covenanters were not the dogmatic authoritarians earlier scholars may have claimed them to be. Depositions are punitive, and this period saw its fair share. Uh, the Covenanters also did not shy away from coercing conformity to the Covenant, making subscription compuls compulsory in 1639. But the removal of opponents and the requisite planting of amenable divines into university posts also suggests that the Covenanters were mindful of the exigency of state building. As recently shown by Laura Stewart, Covenanters were concerned with building a professional state predicated on strict Presbyterian mores. What place did the universities have in this process? I contend that like other agents of confessionalization, Covenanters understood that by securing control of the universities, they could guarantee correct instruction uh, and ensure the proper communication of knowledge and discipline to students who would go on to inform and constitute church and state authorities. Within a broader European context, the Covenanters' university policies appear more confessionalized than authoritarian, a development born out of the needs of constructing a confessional state. In much the same way that princes founded universities in building of confessional states in the empire, the Covenanters, while not requiring new universities, remolded existing institutions to fit their confessional agenda. <coughs> the formation of states predicated on specific confessions was contingent on training elites in the universities without states with the localized confessional ethos. Today, I will examine this phenomenon in two contexts, plantations and depositions. My purpose is threefold. First, I intend to account for the reasons why some were translated to professorships while others were removed. Second, I will consider these actions within the Covenanters' ecclesiastical policy and draw conclusions about the university's significance in them. Finally, uh, and briefly, through a comparison to their parliamentarian counterparts in England, uh, I will show that the Covenanters' policies were rather par for the course in not just the European context, but the British as well. So to begin uh, with the plantation. Uh, plantation of leading Covenanting divines into universities was central to their confession building. Uh, in May 1642, Robert Bailey, in a letter to his cousin, wrote that the General Assembly had given the universities almost a sovereign power to call to their profession any minister of the land. Bailey was referencing the General Assembly's higher education overtures for 1641, the third of which stated that, quote, special care be had that the places of the professors, especially the professor of divinity, be filled with the ablest men and the best effect to the reformation of the world's curse. This did not explicitly imbue the universities the power to compel translation, though it did afford them the ability to petition the assembly for calling professors. Though he wished to remain in his quiet rural parish of Kilbane, Bailey had established himself as a leading covenanter. His talent, it seemed, would be best put to use in a university. 
After much difficulty, Glasgow University eventually acquired Daily Services in April 1643. But between 1639 and 1642, several prominent covenanters, covenanters were fixed in university posts. It was only after these translations that this matter of transportation was formalized in the 1642 General Assembly. There it was decided that the borough of Edinburgh would have first access to ministers, while St. Mary's College, St. Andrews, uh, would be first served with divinity professors. Thus, Scotland's capital and chief seminary should be furnished with the brightest minds in order to exert the greatest influence in cultivating a covenant of ministry. But when presented with the option of planting a divine in either a church or university, which did the covenanters prefer? Two episodes emerged at the 1639 General Assembly that I think provide some clarity to this. Uh, the first concerned David Dixon's translation from his, from his ministry at Irvine to Glasgow University. The borough of Glasgow called Dixon to the vacant ministry of the High Church of Glasgow. Bailey argued that if the General Assembly <coughs> moved Dixon against his wishes, it would amount to, quote, a new theory much worse than Episcopal oppression, um, which we are but yet shaking on. Likewise, the Irvine Secretary argued that um, the Irvine Presbytery argued that the assembly would overextend its authority by commanding uh, Dixon's removal. Glasgow's commissioners, however, argued that Dixon's transportation to the high church would also benefit the adjacent university. The Irvine Presbytery disputed this reasoning, for Dixon was not being called to teach the video. Quote, seeing he is called to be a pastor to their high church and not a professor in the college, any one of them being sufficient to take up the whole man, that argument is a farce for he cannot be called. Irvine argued that, the Presbytery argued that one could not oversee a ministerial uh, charge and teach divinity. Uh, the General Assembly agreed, and Dixon remained at Irvine. But the matter had not come to a close. Glasgow University presented its own petition to the 1639 Assembly, where Principal John Curran <coughs> requested the augmentation of the teaching. His petition prompted a visitation with the power to transport anyone found fit for the divinity post. This, the visitation reported to the 1640 General Assembly that it had used this authority to transport Dixon, who took up his new post in March. Though he had been against moving Dixon to the high church, Bailey was a proponent of transferring his friend to the university and conceived of Dixon's uh, new professorship as a way to neutralize whatever remained of Glasgow's opposition to the covenant. The General Assembly agreed to prefer Dixon's appointment to Glasgow's professorship. The second episode that emerged at the 1639 General Assembly concerned the translation of Samuel Rutherford, another prominent, probably the most prominent covenant of the church. Uh, when confronted with the choice of moving Rutherford to either Scotland's capital, Edinburgh, or its chief seminary, St. Mary's, the General Assembly elected to translate Rutherford to the latter. Rutherford did not assume the principalship, which has been uh, stated in some sources, but instead assumed a divinity post. In both these cases, the General Assembly had declined to move two ministers into new ministries, and Rutherford to Edinburgh, no less, and instead preferred their translations to universities. While Glasgow and St. Andrews have petitioned for these professorships, it is still telling that the Covenanters should find their services best put to use in the university. Thus, by the time Glasgow University uh, called for Robert Bailey's services in 1642, the General Assembly's <coughs> tendency for planting universities meant that Bailey's removal from the winning was certain. The trajectory of Bailey's translation resembled Dixon's. After the General Assembly refused Dixon's move to the high church, the borough of Glasgow called for Bailey's services. Bailey refused, and the General Assembly similarly ruled that he stay in Kilwinning. The matter once again seemed to have concluded until the university came calling. And over the first half of 1642, Glasgow University attempted to convince Bailey to take the second professorship of divinity. Uh, the university brought the matter before the Senate there, but Bailey maintained his opposition. Yet as he began to reach out to his friends for advice in that, it became increasingly clear that Bailey's future lay within the walls of the academy. Robert Ramsey, minister of Glasgow's Blackfriars Church, uh, urged Bailey to accept this call. He pressed his friend that, quote, you shall be made the instrument to breed many youths who shall be leaders of sundry congregations and ministers for the church and find yourself obliged to employ your talents there where you most may be serviceable. In a university, Bailey would have the greatest impact. 
He stood to influence the future leaders of the Kirk as opposed to continuing in a rural, par rural parish where he would be much less impactful. Ramsey also noted that Bailey did not go to Glasgow. He risked being moved farther afield to other universities, all of whom had expressed <coughs> interest in his services. <coughs> Dixon shared the sentiment and seemed most exasperated with his friend's obstinacy, particularly because Bailey had been a key, key reason why Dixon had moved to Glasgow University in 1640. Dixon was confident that the assembly would move to, quote, settle this man in some university where there will be no rest to it. Bailey entered Glasgow University the following April 1643. Thus, by the 1642 General Assembly at St. Andrews, uh, a pattern was discernible. The Assembly preferred the translation of the entire Trinity University. A concerted effort had been made to repurpose three prominent covenanting divines into divinity professors in order to educate the next generation of covenant churchmen. When the 1642 General Assembly passed an act for the transplantation of professors and ministers, it was formality. Practice had by then been established. Uh, but with the plantations, we have the removals as well. The deposition of university staff, which began before the revolutionary Glasgow Assembly met, um, at, uh, met at, uh, in November 1638. The universities had been nearly unanimous in their opposition to the covenant. It was only at Edinburgh that support for the covenant outweighed opposition. In October, the Edinburgh Town Council removed two regions who opposed the covenant. This appears to have been the only time a church court was not involved in removing university staff in this period. Beginning at the Glasgow Assembly, the Covenanters would oversee a series of depositions and forced resignations. This began with Patrick Panter, a St. Mary's divinity professor who was indicted uh, by the Glasgow Assembly for Arminianism and opposing the covenant. He was only deposed, however, a year later at the 1639 Assembly. Indeed, while the Covenanters were concerned with rooting heterodoxy out of the universities, this process could be protracted. Uh, this was also evident in Aberdeen, the Covenanters and the Covenanting, uh, where the bulk of depositions took place. <clears throat> Aberdeen and its doctors had been the Covenanters' greatest opponents. The Covenanters were able to use the internal disputes at King's College Aberdeen as an opportunity to commission a visitation to bring the university to line. As Montrose, uh, as Montrose's army descended upon Aberdeen in spring 1639, the Assembly's commissioners recalled all masters who had fled the borough. All King's masters present were forced to subscribe to the covenant and were made to do public penance for taking communion from the deposed Bishop of Aberdeen uh, out of Bellingham. The commissioners next deposed all those absent, including Principal William Leslie, himself an Aberdeen doctor, uh, the Regent Alexander Strogi, the son of the doctor of the same name. Leslie's charges also included his failure to sign the covenant, his refusal to acknowledge the Glasgow Assembly, and his communication with Bishop Bellenden. The April 69 visitation also commanded that all those absent, <coughs> absent were to be ejected from their offices. This would have included the absent John Forbes, of course, Professor of Divinity at King's, the Aberdeen Doctor's leading light, and the Covenanter's most formidable intellectual opponent. But Forbes remained active at and in his diary, he notes that in mid July 1639, he had concluded his lectures for the summer. If Forbes had been absent from Aberdeen during the April 1639 presentation, he returned to continue his teaching. Uh, <clears throat> that October, he was also listed among the King's Masters as the new academic year <coughs> commenced. Uh, this calls into question the weight of the commissioner's authority, but also speaks to the confusion of the time. The first bishop's war was ongoing, and several of the Aberdeen doctors had left borough. It is not unlikely that Forbes had returned to Kings out of a sense of duty to his teaching, which he viewed as a service of God, uh, as well as to keep the near abandoned university operating. But it was not until July 1640 that Forbes faced the commission, only weeks in advance of the General Assembly's meeting at Aberdeen. He maintained his refusal to take the covenant unconditionally. The commission noted that in refusing unconditional subscription, Forbes was disobeying the Assembly's active mandatory subscription to the covenant. But Forbes was not persuaded, and he was, and he was thus charged to appear before the assembly and cease teaching, which was simple enough as the academic year had already ended. With the General Assembly meeting in Aberdeen in July 1640, Forbes referred to himself and his colleagues as, quote, lambs in the midst of the bull. In a week, the assembly proceeded against ministers, university staff, and expectants to the ministry. The process of removing opponents from the university began with the confirmation of Leslie and Scroggins' deposition. The assembly then proposed James Sybil, the Aberdeen doctor, and the divinity faculty at King's. 
civil which charges with refusing to subscribe to the preaching Arminian doctrine, and circulating the works of the Irenicist theologian William Forbes, the former Bishop of Edinburgh. With nearly all of the Aberdeen doctors either deposed or deceased, the final step in breaking their influence was the Forbes. Forbes. He initially appeared before the, uh, before the assembly on 29th of July, alongside his brethren, and was published on the 1st of August. The assembly admired Forbes' piety and erudition, uh, and chose to allow him more time to contemplate subscription. But Forbes never wavered from his opposition. When he came to Edinburgh in March 1641, he refused to subscribe to the covenant. In April, he was deposed and his professorship declared vacant, quote, to the great grief of the youth, uh, to the youth and young students of theology in Aberdeen. Aberdeen was not alone in having his faculty called by the covenanters. At St. Mary's, following Patrick's deposition, Principal Robert Howey was removed not for opposition to the covenant, but for financial mismanagement. Howey had misappropriated funds out of the college, rents, and transferred them to his son and others. When the Committee of States threatened to review the matter, Howey removed his place. He had initially opposed the covenant, but converted to the cause. The little is known about Howey's business after 1648. It appears a combination of old age and financial irregularities prompted his ouster. The covenanters however, did, however, allow Howey to maintain his site. This was a moderate and gracious settlement, but in summer 1641 there was little need to interdict it as the covenanters were ascended in Scotland. <clears throat> At Glasgow, with the discovery in 1646 of Principal John Strain's correspondence with Walter Bachanal, the Scottish Dean of Rochester, and his unpublished treatise defending the King's Covenant of 1638, prompted an affair that unfolded as the covenanters' unity, unity fractured in the wake of the engagement. These compromising documents prompted the General Assembly to call for a review of strength of teaching notes. Leading covenanting divines, including Rutherford, Dixon, and Bailey, reviewed Strang's dictates. Strang found the whole matter unique. Uh, in his mind, it was impossible that his colleagues review his dictates and, <laughs> and uh, not find points of disagreement. Um, it was the nature of divinity instruction. <laughs> uh, there does not appear to have been evidence of doctrinal error in Strang's dictates. Uh, those scruples arose over points in his dictates. Uh, given the intellectual might gathered to review these papers, uh, however, that academic dispute should arise as unsurprising. Strang was exonerated at the 1647 General Assembly, but his days as principal were numbered. In April 1650, the General Assembly accepted Strang's resignation and approved the statement of the principal's orthodoxy. Whereas the Aberdeen doctors were removed from their posts as the Covenanters mainly unified uh, and ascended, purged opponents to their movement, <coughs> the resignation came under the newly ascended Kirk party, which reigned over the divided Church of Scotland. A final series of depositions at St. Andrews are emblematic of the Kirk party's purges. They targeted John Barron, Provost of St. Salvatore's, Thomas Blake, Regent of St. Salvatore's, and David Nave, the Regent of St. Leonard's. All have in some way supported, or at least failed to oppose publicly the engagement. Uh, Nave was the first to be removed in, uh, first removed in February 1649. He was tried for his miscarriages and faults, which included his opposition to the Kirk party. The commission deposed Nave, believing him to be a dangerous influence in the college. Following Nave's deposition, the commission of the General Assembly called for a trial of Barry Blake. Uh, Blake first uh, attempted to argue his case, but chose to resign his place before the commission could go through with the sentence of deposition. Barron also avoided formal deposition and resigned uh, his provostship and evaded further punishment by claiming that sickness prohibited him from discharging his duties. So by April 1641, the Covenanters had subdued their chief adversaries in the universities. After 1641, the removal of uh, removal of university staff does not appear to have been based on <coughs> rooting out anti-covenanters, though conformity to the Kirk Party's anti-engagement stance saw a new round of objections on the property conference. So to conclude, I have offered a snapshot of the transformation of the Scottish professor under the covenanters. In addition to planting universities, the covenanters were also concerned with purging those hostile to their aims, especially as the covenanters consolidated their rule. Consolidated their rule. Indeed, depositions and other force removals were tools by which the Covenanters sought to remake the universities in order to serve a covenant to Scotland. When analyzing the nature of faculty turnover, it is evident that the Covenanters engaged in an aggressive supervision of university affairs that went beyond reforming curriculum. 
there is particular attention paid to who is doing the teaching, not merely what is being taught. And to reiterate, this was emblematic of the necessities of constructing a confessional state. Engendering conformity to a specific godly vision required ensuring that those educated in the universities could furnish this vision. Those who taught in the universities had to share this confessional idea. Um, briefly, uh, at the end, uh, earlier I suggested that we should think of the Covenanters' university policies as part of a wider European phenomenon that saw early modern political and ecclesiastical authorities assume closer control over institutions of higher education. In this respect, the Covenanters' schemes were not unique in the sense that they were concerned with recasting universities into the service of a confessional state. <clears throat> but when we look at the events of the 1640s and 1650s uh, in the British Isles, it becomes evident that the Covenanters' university policies are not necessarily unique in a purely British context either. The planting and purging of the university faculty of Oxford and Cambridge were also features of the Civil Wars. Parliament conquered Cambridge in 1644 and Oxford in 1646. It then inaugurated a series of visitations that proposed masters and fellows of royalist, anti-Calvinist, and or Laudian persuasions, all of whom refused to conform to Parliament's control. In 1649, the newly ascended Cromwellian regime drew on this framework to further reform the university. More purges took place primarily among those who opposed the regicide and refused subscriptions of loyalty to the Commonwealth. What is striking about the Covenanters and Parliamentarians' university <coughs> policies are their conventionality. We see in these cases no calls for the radical reshaping of the university and its purpose. Uh, the institutional endurance of the universities was just a key phenomenon in this period. As institutions whose operations were affected but not necessarily impeded by the vicissitudes of the British Revolution, the universities could be shaped into bodies to support the educational, political, and religious visions of whoever emerged victorious on the battlefield. Ensuring that those who staffed these institutions supported the confessional visions of those in power and could thus communicate those ideals to a new generation was a vital way to guarantee the continuation and propagation 